Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. If you'd like to submit a question to our guest today, please do that via the chat function at the bottom of the screen where I'll be monitoring for your questions. We're really, uh, we're really just delighted today to welcome a, a friend, uh, independent journalist, author, commentator, filmmaker, uh, founder of the Grain Zone Project, Max Blumenthal. Max, uh, welcome. Great to be here, Michael. Uh, so let's get right into it, Max. In the year and a half uh, since you were here in Fort Wayne, you were married. Uh, so congratulations uh, to you. Thank you. I know your many friends in the audience want to know how you and your wife Anya are doing during the COVID quarantine. So why don't you catch us up? Well, uh, it's sad to say, but we're probably doing better than most people uh, because we have jobs where we can work at home and work on our own schedules. And unlike many people in the media, we're not under threat of being laid off by a corporation that's cutting costs. Um, we're doing better than a lot of people in Washington, DC who are now facing eviction. Um, the checks from the government have stopped coming. So uh, we're doing pretty well. And you know we're also relatively young. So the threat of COVID doesn't affect us as much as it does, for example, my parents' generation. Uh, so we've been able to be somewhat mobile, but we haven't been able to do field reporting like we did last year, where we were covering events from so many hotspots and providing the other side of the story that US corporate media won't tell you about Venezuela or Syria or Nicaragua, for example, countries where the US seeks regime change. Uh, what I've traditionally done in Palestine, haven't been able to go to these places. And one reason besides the quarantine and lockdowns around the world is that we're Americans <coughs> and we're now the center of the virus. Um, so you could maybe call this the US virus at this point. Many countries are just afraid of Americans and the EU has locked us out. That's a pretty sad commentary on where our, on, on, our, on the competence of our leadership. But you know, we're, we're fine and I hope everyone out there is, is doing well. Um, I think it's really important in these times that you have a community like the one that um, I met and experienced when I was in Fort Wayne. And you know, the, if there's any silver lining to this crisis, it's that it's brought me closer to a lot of people in my you know, political so, um, social justice community, but also a lot of my neighbors out here in Southeast DC. You know, Max, uh, you brought this up, so let me just pursue this. And I know it's an old story, but it has relevance to what's happening in our country today. So that's why I'm bringing it up. You came to Fort Wayne a year and a half ago in February, 2019, uh, directly from Venezuela, where you were writing about the US-backed coup. Uh, in May last year, you covered the protests at the Venezuelan embassy. You know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Uh, this in turn led to your arrest in October and subsequent dismissal of the bogus charges. The reason I'm bringing up this nine month old case is that there's a confluence here uh, of an arrest on a, a bogus charge, mysteriously missing government evidence, the collusion of the State Department with a foreign government to attack peace activists, and more. So talk to us about what you've learned through this whole you know, uh, a strange confluence of events and your continuing interest and coverage of Venezuela. Yeah, I think I have a lot of um, maybe maybe more questions than answers because uh, the, the question that I have is how did a uh, five month warrant that was never, how, how did it happen that after an incident five months later where I was falsely accused of assaulting a 59 year old woman with no evidence, five months later, I was arrested. Were there, was there a political motive behind this? Uh, was, were there state actors involved in 
um, pressuring the judge to authorize this phony warrant. I, I think I'll never learn those answers. But basically, I mean, if everyone watching this is familiar with the situation of Palestine and Gaza in particular, where Gaza is under siege because the US and Israel do not approve of their elected government. Uh, they are unable to have an economy and Israel is basically putting the people of Gaza in the words of one of the designers of the siege, Dove Weissglass, who's a longtime Israeli government advisor, putting them on a diet so that they don't starve. That's what the US is doing to Venezuela. It's also doing that to Iran and increasingly to Syria. And it's been doing that to Cuba off and on with a brief uh, pause under Obama with his normalization policy for decades. Uh, the US is trying to prevent Venezuela from even getting fuel deliveries right now. It is sanctioning a free food program in Venezuela that is used to feed 3 million families. They give them food at almost no cost and sanitary supplies in a country where most of the population is poor. 3 million families is a substantial portion of the entire Venezuelan population. And the US is trying to prevent that program from importing food. It's starving the government of revenue and without revenue, the government is unable to provide food. This is a socialist oriented government in a mixed economy that has nationalized its oil and the largest oil reserves in the world. And the entire, if you take a close look at, at the fake uh, coup administration of Juan Guaido, as we have at the gray zone, you'll see that many of the personnel are oil lobbyists. Uh, his attorney general who just resigned was a paid uh, expert in court cases involving the oil industry. He was paid by the oil industry. The fake ambassador here who oversaw that siege at the embassy in Venezuela, Carlos Vecchio, he was Exxon Mobil's main lawyer in Venezuela. So what they want to do is get those natural, get their hands on the natural resources in Venezuela by toppling a government that was elected. And so it's under siege. One of the first moves they made in the U.S. to uh, put, to, to, to kind of ratchet up the pressure on the legitimate government in Venezuela, the U.N. recognized one, was to hand its embassy here in the middle of Washington, D.C. in Georgetown over to Carlos Vecchio, the Exxon Mobil lobbyist I mentioned, and his kind of white collar mafia. And as that was happening, an employee, the Venezuelan staffers handed the keys over to Code Pink and a coalition of activists here and said, you know, you take over, hold them off, you, let's, let's have a protest. Um, and for a month, we were having the best time there, having teach ins. Um, there were, there were concerts, uh, performances, and it became a real center of uh, a real center of activity for the activism community and the progressive community in Washington. Then one night, out of nowhere, this mob showed up, and the right-wing Venezuelan exile community of people who are like working in corporations and the World Bank and the art, the defense industry in Washington, uh, people who despise the government in Caracas and most of the population who have racist attitudes, homophobic attitudes, they came out and basically laid siege to the embassy and were functioning kind of as like a proxy for the secret service police because they weren't allowed to go in and take everyone out without orders. They were trying to break down the doors. They were shout, shouting racial epithets at, you know, black people outside uh, who, you know, who are protesting, uh, homophobic, invective, you name it. And what they were trying to do is starve everyone in the embassy out. I was on the outside and, you know, typically I'm a journalist, but I, you know, I saw that there wasn't enough organization to get food in. And I also am a night owl. So I would just kind of probe the different vulnerabilities in the siege night after night at the embassy, just observing. And I figured out how we, to get food in non-violently, completely peacefully to basically trick the right-wing Venezuelan mob. One night they tried to confront us uh, very 
I mean, they, they confronted us. I still like didn't have any violent engagement with anyone. We got a bunch of food in. They were really upset. And the next day they concocted this lie that me and three men had assaulted a 59 year old woman and beat her to within inches of her life. The woman just made up a story. She was put up to it by, you know, basically US backed forces, Juan Guaido's forces. And five months later, I had a team of DC cops show up at my door, surrounded my house, threatened to break down my door and threw me in jail for two days. I had to wait about 48 hours to see a judge. Um, you know, in my pajamas. So that was the experience. And uh, I still don't have answers about that. But at the same time, I don't have any regrets. We really uh, held them off for weeks. And we exposed the true face of the US backed Venezuelan opposition. I strongly believe that there was pressure on the local authorities and the government to execute this phony warrant against me. Thanks, thanks for that kind of update, Max. Uh, I think you filled in, even though you still have questions, you filled in a lot of blanks for me as I read a number of articles about your, uh, about your arrest and then the subsequent uh, dismissal of charges. Of course, you know, this raises, you hinted at it, right? This raises the issue of the use of US military forces, including the, uh, those of the Department of Homeland Security in U.S. cities, right, like uh, Portland, that was yeah. in Chicago now, uh, uh, St. Louis, uh, uh, Kansas City, uh, and other cities. Uh, you want to say a word about that? Well, there's a lot to say about it. We had them here in Washington first, yeah. and on, uh, well, you know, it, it was supposedly, ex you know, they were brought into the city supposedly to counter looting. Um, and this was a phony premise. It, it was clear to me on May 31st, when the George Floyd protests were beginning to peak, that the use of federal troops was a political ploy by Donald Trump. It was an election ploy to stir up a kind of culture war, even a race war in American streets, and to try to embarrass local democratic authorities and make them seem like they've lost control of their cities and to bring out older voters who are afraid. And it led to some really severe consequences here. On May 31st, I went out downtown in Washington where there was what you could call looting. And it was really groups of poor black youth who were angry about what had happened, but who were also completely marginalized in this city. Um, and the Democratic mayor here, Muriel Bowser, she's a protege of Mike Bloomberg. She's privatizing everything. She's handing the city over to developers. Tons of public money is going into the hands of developers and they're not providing any affordable housing. And the black community in DC for the most part is being displaced at a rapid rate. This is the most gentrified city in the country. So this kind of activity was inevitable. And what I actually saw was the smashing of windows but not really any looting. They were kind of trying to make a statement. Also, there was no school because of the coronavirus lockdown. Um, you had so much pent up aggression. People had been forced in their homes. And the federal troops were around everywhere as well as the police and they were not acting. Um, it was really remarkable to see they were standing around pretty much not doing anything. And I got the sense that they were trying to create the perception of violence so that they could step in, but they needed to allow it to happen first. And it was happening all over the city, just windows being smashed. The next day, Trump and Mark Esper, the defense secretary, who's a lobbyist for the arms industry, they authorized a show, a military show of force against the protest. I was there uh, marching with about a thousand people through Washington. There was no violence that I saw. It was a completely peaceful protest and two military helicopters descended on us like something I'd never seen before. It made me really feel like the opening scene of Terminator 2, like I was a witness to this Skynet machine descending on us, uh, maybe a hundred feet overhead. We could have thrown rocks and hit the helicopters and it was in a Black Hawk helicopter and a Lakota helicopter marked with the Red Cross uh, 
it was a mil as a is a medical helicopter for the National Guard marked with the Red Cross insignia. So a complete violation of the Geneva Convention. Yeah. And what it it felt like was a tornado when they lower themselves that close over your head. Uh, I was kicking up not just dust but bottles and trash. Uh, my bike, I had my bike with me. My I lo I lost control of my bike and the chain cut into my leg. People were momentarily huddling against buildings, trying to take cover as if it was a war. And then I watched the protesters actually get back into a formation and collect themselves. And there was this standoff for 20 minutes, 30 minutes with the helicopter and the helicopter eventually left. And it felt like a victory. That was the same day Trump ordered the park police to tear gas protesters and priests at a church while he did this ridiculous display holding a Bible. And the following day, you saw the defense secretary and uh, Mark Milley, who's the head of the Joint Chiefs, actually turn on Trump and declare that they were embarrassed by what had just taken yeah. place. Um, but now what we're seeing in Portland is Trump turned to the Department of Homeland Security, which is run by someone named Chad Wolf, who is a, has the experience of being a corporate lobbyist who's never been confirmed by the Senate, who's a complete lackey going in with under the same dubious premises and using unmarked US marshals uh, and border police from Customs and Border Patrol from their BORTAC units, which have the authorization to go to any city, no matter how far they are from the border and literally kidnapping protesters and throwing them in rented minivans like an American Gestapo. Uh, and I think everyone watching this in the world not only looks at it with horror, but those countries in the global South that the US is sanctioning, look at it and say, what a bunch of hypocrites. How dare you preach to us about repression or authoritarianism when you're doing this in your streets? This is Trump's reelection strategy. And just one more point, uh, these groups are operating, these unmarked, untrained, these are not groups that are trained for riot control. Uh, law enforcement, federal law enforcement agencies operate under the auspices of the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security should not exist. It never should have existed. It's a product of post 9-11 hysteria. And we saw the first DHS director, Tom Ridge, who is a Republican, condemn what Trump is doing in Portland yep. by saying, well, DHS was created to fight global terror. Well, what what was th what was that? That was the it was he's referring to a fake war on terror where terrorism is defined as anything from Palestinian resistance to Saddam Hussein to Major General Qasem Soleimani of Iran, who is who actually helped defeat ISIS in Syria to anything the U.S. government doesn't like. So it's only a matter of time before this gigantic agency with the power to oppress across the country and to deport undocumented people would become the president's personal Praetorian guard as soon as the president decided that his domestic political enemies were terrorists. And that's what we're seeing play out. This is the inevitable result of the construction of the post 9-11 security state. I want you, I want you to, uh, I've got a lot of questions here. I know uh, uh, other folks are gonna weigh in too, but you brought it up. Uh, I, I want you to weigh in on this as well. You recently, and, and make this connection, you wrote an article entitled From Occupation to Occupy, the Israelification of American Domestic Security, where among other examples, you note, quote, a hundred members of the 800 strong Minneapolis Police Department were trained at a counterterrorism conference overseen by the Israeli consulate in 2012, which means, quote, at least one of every eight members of the city's force were influenced by the methods of an occupied, an occupying apartheid entity. So Max, as you're making these connections, tell us about Urban Shield, uh, introduce us to Urban Shield, JINSA, J-I-N-S-A, surveillance technology sharing and other things that you talked about in that article. Well, absolutely, and I would, ask anyone participating if uh, any members of the Fort Wayne police have participated in these training programs with Israel because 
I think now more than ever, it's really important to inform the activist community in your city about that and to push for the cancellation of those programs. Um, Urban Shield is a program that is carried out every year in, uh, I believe it's in the Bay Area and it's carried out in a stadium and tactical units from police departments around the world, SWAT teams train together. It's kind of an exhibition, a SWAT exhibition. And this is where US SWAT teams come into contact with SWAT teams from the Israeli Yamam and Yassam, who are the tactical unit of the Israeli border police, one of the most brutal wings of the Israeli security forces. This, these, are, these are the units that carry out some of the most heinous atrocities against Palestinians. Along, they've also trained alongside the Bahraini tactical forces, uh, a country that brutally put down uh, protests at the beginning of the Arab Spring with the full support of the United States. So Israel really exists at the central node of this giant security nexus around the world where various states, mostly Western states, are training together in tactics of repression and control. Israel markets itself as the master because it's had 70 years of experience dominating a rest of indigenous population. That's why the Israeli arms industry for a country of six or seven million people is so robust because they go to arms fairs with various missiles and munitions and drone technology. And they say that our arms were battle tested. Many countries can't say that, but they can say we use this on so many operations, we guarantee you that it works and they make those sales. So a huge part of the Israeli economy is uh, thriving because of the arms industry. But then you have Israel's tactics of repression, which have given it this reputation, particularly within American policing after 9-11, uh, that it doesn't deserve of being these masters, for example, in airport security. So you had an Israeli uh, officer, Israeli army officer, go to Boston Logan Airport and start training airport personnel in racial profiling, which is what Israel uses at Ben Gurion International Airport. They say, oh, we don't have metal detectors. We don't have these aggressive invasive searches like you do with the TSA. But no, what they do is they just racially profile people. And if you're an Arab, then you are suspect. Uh, if you're a single wo woman from the US entering, you're a suspect because they fear you might go and participate in a uh, program in the West Bank in Bethlehem, for example. So they profile everyone. That's what they began doing at Boston Logan Airport. And Boston Logan Airport began getting hit with lawsuit after lawsuit, anti-discrimination suits by black travelers because they put into place the Israeli system. Then Michael, you mentioned JINSA, the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. They're one of the main uh, Israel lobby groups after 9-11 that began implementing the training of police officers domestically in the US through Israeli tactics with Israeli police uh, leadership. Thousands of American police officers went through these programs. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned one in Minneapolis that was, took place in Chicago at the consulate. A hundred officers, which is one eighth of the whole police force were instructed in Israeli tactics. What, what do they learn? I mean, what are they actually being taught? First of all, they're being taught to love Israel. They're being taught to admire Israel. So it's just Israel lobbying. Uh, and then they go on some of the high level police brass get taken on trips by the Anti-Defamation League or what I call the Defamation League uh, to Israel itself. But, you know, you have small town police chiefs or even people in Minneapolis and they're learning things like how to shoot a suicide bomber, you know, as if the U.S., as if, you know, the the, the Department of Lansing is going to come into contact with a suicide bomber. It's ridiculous. What they do is they deepen the mistrust between police and citizens, where police throughout this militarization process in the US have been trained to see all citizens, and particularly black and brown citizens, as potential criminals and not neighbors or people, people as part of the community. That's what it does. And it just deepens the process of militarization 
it got to a point where Avi Dichter, the former head of the Israeli Shin Bet security services addressed an FBI convention alongside Robert Mueller in 2007 and said that you're not facing crime or terrorism, you're facing crime terror. All crime is terror and you need to treat it as such. And it's that mentality that I think is so dangerous when we look at the Israeli training of American police forces. Yeah, it's not just uh, hardware. It's a surveillance technology. It's uh, uh, the training. It's a, it's a change in really a, a culture mentality uh, that they export. Let me let me take yeah, you to your, let me take you to your more most recent book, Max, uh, uh, and kind of continue this conversation. One of the epigraphs of your latest book, "The Management of Savagery." how America's national security state fueled the rise of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Donald Trump. I love the subtitle. Um, one of the epigraphs is from uh, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton when she was speaking to the House Appropriations Committee from April 2009. This is what she said, and this is what you quote in the epigraph. And then I'm going to ask you to kind of unpack it for us. Uh, let's remember here, the people we're fighting today, we funded 20 years ago, and we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. There's a very strong argument, which is, it wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union, but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. So I saw that as a thesis, as at least kind of one of the theses of, your, of the, the, the overall project of your book. You want to unpack that for us? Yeah, and the other uh, ep epigraph or quote in the epigraph was from Hillary Clinton's top foreign policy advisor, Jake Sullivan, in an email that was released on WikiLeaks. Al Qaeda is on our side in Syria. You know, he was excited about that. Uh -huh. And that really speaks to the mentality of the national security state, this sort of opaque sociopathic bureaucracy that is dedicated to one thing and one thing only, American hegemony. So oh, historically, but especially since the fateful year of 1979, where my book begins, the US has relied on Islamist or even jihadist forces as a proxy in order to undermine and destabilize its geopolitical foes, specifically the Soviet Union uh, and the US operation in Afghanistan, arming the so-called Mujahideen, which was the biggest CIA covert operation to date, Operation Cyclone. Um, in my book, I established that as the foundation for the 9-11 attacks. The 9-11 attacks were blowback from that operation because that's what brought Al Qaeda to the battlefield. It's what made bin Laden a hero. It established that whole network and the US presided over it from behind the scenes through these unaccountable intelligence entities. Then, you know, after 9-11, we had the fake war on terror. Muslim civil society was targeted here at home. Islamophobia uh, spread rapidly. Palestinians were defined as terrorists for resisting. Ariel Sharon told George W. Bush, Arafat is our bin Laden and this false conflation of international jihadism and local resistance was consolidated in our media. And then as the war on terror kind of faded away after the Obama era, the US, re at, at the end of the Obama era, the US reverted to its traditional relationship with Islamists and jihadists, which is to use them as a proxy this time against a resurgent Russia in Syria uh, in order to topple the government in Damascus, do what it did in Libya, which was to completely destabilize a previously prosperous and stable country that did not, that operated independent of US hegemony. And what happened? The, I mean, it, the, we've, we were still experiencing the blowback from that covert operation. Operation Timber Sycamore, in which the U.S. spent one out of every $13 in the CIA budget to arm, equip, and train literal allies of Al-Qaeda in Syria. Uh, 
And this is just one of many examples. So it really exposes the whole hollowness of the war on terror itself. And it shows where we're going uh, geopolitically and what kind of strategies the national security state is employing. The war on terror is over now. And now the US is uh, operating in what it calls a great power competition. It's a cold war and the US the Trump administration is obviously accelerating the process. It's more hostile and more aggressive than I think a democratic administration would be, but the, both parties are united on the need to contain and destabilize the two biggest threats to American hegemony, Russia and China, but specifically China. China is the greatest threat to American hegemony and it's operating along socialist lines. So just yesterday or two days ago, the Trump administration ejected the Chinese consulate from Houston. Um, this is a major escalation. Yeah. And uh, I think that's where we're going. But my book, I think it, 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 bring, it brings us full circle from the first Cold War to the new Cold War. And I think anyone who reads it should be terrified of where we're going because of the history of what Cold Wars do to society, specifically our own. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. We'll come back to some of the things that you've been talking about here, but you're in a particularly unique position to make a comment since you're a journalist and a commentator yourself uh, on, on the recent open letter by a number of authors, including J.K. Rowling, Salman Rushdie, Margaret Atwood, Noam Chomsky, and Harper's Magazine, decrying the freedom of speech by what's come to be known as they don't use this language in their letter, but what's come to be known as cancel culture. Their letter was met with, a, with a, a backlash by a number of commentators on the left, including our friend in Nazareth, Jonathan Cook. So uh, Max, what, what, what's your take on the letter and the backlash? And by the way, uh, if you'd like to include in your comment, uh, the resignation of the one you call the neocon Hansel queen, uh, Barry Weiss from the New York Times, uh, who, by the way, attacked in strenuous terms one of our upcoming interviewees, Linda Sarsour. So that's a long, involved question, but you get the gist of what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems kind of silly to, to devote time and energy to this, but I think that anyone who's participating in this and who's participated in within your group has experienced uh, the feeling of attempts to cancel them, even to get them to lose their jobs because of their dedication to Palestine solidarity. And I go around the country and talk to Palestine solidarity activists who are just common people who are, you know, nurses or Uber drivers, uh, people who work in offices who have faced the threat of losing their job for having their activism exposed. This is, I think, this is where the real cancel culture takes place. And it's a top-down process with wealthy pro-Israel organizations targeting common people for standing up for justice in Palestine. Many of the people on that Harper's letter participated in that process uh, or canceled uh, people for other progressive causes. And I pointed that out. I did an interview with Aaron Mate that's up at our YouTube channel at, at the Gray Zone, where I go through the list of people who have participated in cancel culture, but now are condemning it because they feel that their own platforms are being threatened and that new voices are coming in that are upsetting the consensus, the old consensus. So I find them to be hypocrites. Uh, they're just a collection of hypocrites. Many of them, most of them are wedded to the idea of Israel as an exclusively Jewish state. J.K. Rowling may be the biggest hypocrite. Uh, she spent months and months, years, trying to cancel Jeremy Corbyn over his compassion for Palestinians and just lying, calling him and so many people in the Labour Party in UK anti-Semites. Uh, and she signed the letter because she's come under attack for her views on trans people. Um, and that seems to be what everybody's debating. And it's you know, very few people will really talk about 
pro-Israel cancel culture, which is what brought Barry Weiss to the forefront. It's the reason she's prominent. She was a project of the Israel lobby, as I detailed in uh, the piece that I wrote. Yep. about calling her the queen of cancel culture. I mean, her career as a young woman was funded by pro-Israel billionaires and millionaires. She was trained through these billionaire-backed pro-Israel programs and brought while she was at Columbia University trying to destroy the career of Joseph Mossad, who I think is the premier Palestinian scholar in the American Academy. Uh, fortunately, she failed, but she got, she probably got the dean of SEPA at Columbia uh, to be fired. She nearly got the dean of Columbia fired. She created a crisis on campus. And now she's whining because her colleagues at the New York Times were mean to her. So these people are the biggest hypocrites. At the same time, I got to say, I'm targeted, I'm, I'm targeted with this all the time for my views, uh, not just on Palestine, but on Syria as well. There was a, you know, even within Palestine solidarity circles, there was an attempt to quote unquote cancel me. Uh, it was absolutely pathetic. It was over my exposés of the White Helmets, uh, whose founder, who's a British military intelligence officer, James Lemercerier, uh, was just found to have committed massive amounts of fraud and committed suicide. So, I mean, I've been vindicated about that, but the point is no one tried to engage me or argue publicly with me there was just calls to blacklist me and blacklisting did take place. Uh, none, of the, none of the people, this happened very publicly. My book tour for the management of savagery uh, was postponed because of an attempt to intimidate a bookstore, the main bookstore here in Washington DC, politics and prose from hosting me. And my talk was suspended the day after the window of that bookstore, a back window was broken. I don't know how that happened. This all was very public. This was playing out in local DC uh, media. It was playing out on social media. And none of the people who signed that Harper's letter said a word for me, yeah. not one word, because they probably agreed that I should be beyond the pale. Even though my arguments have been, I think, vindicated, the gray zone is now listed as a deprecated site on Wikipedia. We are officially blacklisted by Wikipedia, even though Wikipedia is supposed to be this people's encyclopedia and it operates through consensus, but the consensus is controlled by a coterie of neoconservative and possibly state-backed editors who just vandalize the page of any anti-imperialist, anyone who opposes the pro-Israel consensus. And there's nothing we can do to fight back. Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, is himself a supporter of Israel, whose wife is, was Tony Blair's diary secretary. So what we're dealing with really is an elite cancel culture and the debate that's playing out over this letter for the most part that you're gonna read in, you know, local, in, 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 you're gonna read in corporate media or hear about, it's a false debate. It's not about, it doesn't relate to the reality that we, as people who step outside the, con the elite consensus actually experience. You know, you and your partner at the Gray Zone Project, uh, your expose of Wikipedia and Wikimedia, I, we don't have time to get into it now, but I'm glad you referred to it because I'd really encourage people to go to the Gray Zone Project and read your expose. It, it, was, it was news to me, frankly. I learned quite a bit by reading it. Your expose of the founder and the, the whole process by which Wikipedia, Wikimedia exists. Yeah, it's it, basically Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Foundation, they've created a bulletin board for the elite under the guise of popular consensus. The people's and, encyclopedia sort of a thing. Yeah, it's not, a, and it, it, it's, it's a very dangerous mechanism. If I had my way, I'd have my Wikipedia page deleted because anyone who wants to list my achievements or say anything, even just to quote things I've said or make note of a report that I wrote, they'll have that immediately deleted within 10 minutes by this cabal of neoconservative editors who control, who are the top editors. And they have completely violated the rules of the site in order to list us as a deprecated site. So if you cite any of our articles at the gray zone on Wikipedia, it will include a red stop sign with a hand, and it will tell you that you're not allowed to do that. 
and it will tell you that we fabricate information, although there's never been any instance of us getting a major fact wrong. That's the world we live in right now. It's a world where Silicon Valley and the national security state have merged. And if you ask anyone who runs a, a Palestinian media site, particularly from Palestine, um, Al Quds Daily, for example, or um, Shehab Agency Media, they're constantly being removed from Twitter, having their accounts suspended. Uh, one of the most disgusting suspensions was the Venezuelan Ministry of Health, which is providing information on Twitter to Venezuelans during a pandemic, and they were suspended because the US government came in and told Twitter to suspend all the Venezuelan government accounts. Uh, this is not free media at all. It's certainly not independent. I want to return uh, back to foreign policy. Uh, say a word about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, um, uh, plan to annex major parts of the West Bank with um, tacit US approval and encouragement. Uh, his uh, his ongoing court case, uh, his call for elections in November. What are your sources in Israel and Palestine telling you and what's your research telling you? Well, it, it looks to be backfiring in some way. Uh, there was a piece in Jerusalem Post by the editor-in-chief, Yaakov Katz, today, complaining that Netanyahu hadn't acted to um, fully annex anything. And the headline is, uh, shoot and ask questions later saying that's what we should have done. We should have just right away annexed everything and then let the international community freak out um, because they're freaking out anyway. But this is a process that has been in the making for a long time. Basically, the peace process provided Israel with the cover to go into the West Bank and begin putting facts on the ground while meeting Palestinians at who weren't really representative of Palestinian society and having these endless negotiations and telling the world they want peace and having all these liberal Zionists run around forming organizations for the two-state solution and believing in the sham. More settlers were brought to the West Bank under Ehud Barak of the Labor Party than under Ariel Sharon or Benjamin Netanyahu. What they did was simply consolidate the process of Israeli control consolidate apartheid. So when I was first started going to Palestine in 2009 and spending extended periods there, it was pretty clear to me that there was a one state reality on the ground. So instantly I began to advocate for one state solution that was democratic rather than the current apartheid one state reality. It took people like Peter Beinart 11 more years to come to that realization. And it was because of Netanyahu because Netanyahu said, well, we actually don't want peace. We want peace after peace after peace, and we're gonna finally annex everything. Let's just take the mask off of this phony peace process. And it's also because of Donald Trump. I always wonder you know, if Donald Trump's son-in-law uh, had been a Palestinian, if Ivanka Trump had married a Palestinian, would Donald Trump even be president? I wonder about that, but I certainly don't think that uh, this, his relationship with Netanyahu would be the same. Jared Kushner and his family are longtime assets or leaders of the Israel lobby. Absolutely. They funded the settlements through the Kushner Family Foundation, and it's Kushner who's brokered the steal of the century, which gave Netanyahu, emboldened him to the point where they said, finally, we can cast off the phony uh, Oslo process and just do this. But because of the internal chaos that's always present in Israeli politics, he hasn't been able to. His opponents who are sort of in a coalition government with him in the blue and white party, they can't decide whether they're for annexation or against it. Um, Netanyahu has these corruption cases, which are endless, as you mentioned. And there is, uh, there, 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 there are, you know, potentially more political consequences uh, the, and the settlers are freaking out. The so-called Judea and Samaria Council is furious at Netanyahu right now. Meanwhile, um, Israel has completely fallen down and failed. I mean, the Israeli government has completely failed in countering COVID. And you would think they'd be really good at it with all of their great 
surveillance mechanisms. They would have great contact tracing. Um, you would think that their hospitals would be really well prepared if they're preparing for war with Hezbollah or even Iran. And it turns out that they that, that the emperor has no clothes. And there are huge protests that have been ongoing in Tel Aviv against Netanyahu over this colossal failure. So the Israeli system is in chaos and the mask is off right now. And this you know, feeds into our reality. It affects all of us because it creates a lot more political space for us to begin educating our neighbors about what Israel really is. You know, <clears throat> uh, I know time's just flying by here, but I do want you to say a little bit more about uh, Peter Beinert's uh, slow conversion to this one state solution. And uh, uh, he's still not as far as many of us activists want him to go. Uh, we're all trying to figure out exactly where he is in his mind. Is he still trying to stay close to liberal Zionists? Uh, uh, where is he? Uh, talk to us a little bit more about Beinert. Well, I mean, uh I found it absolutely pathetic that it took him this long, but at the same time, it's better late than never. Um, I don't know if, did Rabbi Hillel say that when he said, if not now, when, better late than never? I don't think it was <laughs> Maybe it's part Rabbi of that. Blumenthal. Maybe it's Rabbi Blumenthal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's all I, I can say to him is, you know, because we were putting pressure on him for years, specifically me and Ali Abu Nima, the founder of Electronic Intifada, we would just be hammering him on Twitter because he would just issue these kind of mealy mouth justifications for a Jewish state and a two state solution in the face of so much apartheid that he claimed to condemn. Um, I remember, you know, maybe eight years ago, seven years ago, he co authored a piece with Alan Dershowitz calling for dividing the West Bank into, in their words, three chunks. This is code for annexation. So you could say, oh, he's come a long way. I mean, he used to get hosted by APAC, um, but I think that he knew what the reality was, but was always trying to stay relevant within the Jewish world and to guard his right flank and his career. And now we've reached a point in history and in uh, American Jewish culture where it's possible for him to finally come out and tell the truth that he always knew. Um, you know, I don't look fondly on opportunists but at the same time, I care about change. And I think this is contributing to a sea change in American Jewish opinion. So I have to accept it and welcome it, even if it came way too late, much later than the you know, anti-Zionist Jews of my generation. I want to ask you, uh, we have a number of folks who've been wanting to know about uh, issues in US politics. I'll get you, I'll, I'll get to the presidential stuff in a minute, but I want to First of all, focus on uh, Congress. Just a few weeks ago, 16 term New York Democrat Congressman and chair of the Foreign Service Committee, Elliot Engel was ousted by a middle school principal, Jamal Bowman, who supported by Bernie Sanders and AOC. Uh, many say that Israel, uh, 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 Bowman's uh, cri criticism of Israel and Engel was in the pocket of the Israel lobby. That was one of the major issues. Is this a harbinger of progressive, pro uh, uh, you know, progress, or is it an exception? And are there other places in Congress we should look for hope? I mean, this happened in New York City, in a a, a city where the Israel lobby has traditionally considered, which which is traditionally considered a huge power base, because it has the largest Jewish population of any city in the country, the largest Jewish population of any city outside of Israel. Uh, but many, many Jews voted for Jamal Bowman, Elliot Engel's opponent. Elliot Engel was Mr. APAC. He was also Mr. War. He would just sign off on any sanctions legislation on the House Foreign Relations Committee. He would sa sign off on any war um, he authorized the cruelest sanctions ever on Syria as one of his last acts. And this is someone who's just identified with the side of the Democratic Party that is the moral equal of the Trump wing of the Republican Party. And it, it many 
people just find it, younger people just find it detestable. We're looking at changing demographics in a city like New York, but also changing minds among American Jews and a democratization of at least part of the Democratic Party in urban centers. And that's a huge threat to APAC and to their control over both parties. I think the days of the bipartisan pro-Israel consensus at the base of the parties is over. APAC is hiring more and more Republican lobbyists. I remember a few years ago, they hired a Mormon lobbyist. They're, they're hiring evangelical lobbyists. They created Christians United for Israel. Yeah. Uh, they worked behind the scenes to help Hagee set that up because they saw the writing on the wall. Um, you know, that uh, Jewish federations in Chicago just issued a report that Electronic Intifada reported on about Jewish activism for Palestinians, and they're very afraid of what's going on in Chicago as well. So we're going to see the lobby lean increasingly on the Republican Party as its future base, and that's a huge blow to them. At the same time, I mean, we got the Biden campaign refusing to acknowledge occupation. They won't say that word in their campaign plank. I want so to the ask I yeah. want to let me ask you about the Biden. Forgive me for interrupting. Matt. No, I mean it's relevant. I, I want to uh, I, I want to ask you about Biden, but I want to give some statistics here too, and then complete your thought about Biden because I want to lead right into that. So uh, during this recent call with American Jewish donors, Joe Biden said, "I do not support annexation. I will show up for Israel." Uh, to, uh, to senior foreign, so he says he doesn't support annexation but he's gonna show up for Israel. And his uh, senior foreign policy advisor, Anthony Blinken, said that under no circumstances, not even the, the annexation, would Biden reduce or withhold US military aid to Israel. So they're trying to have it both ways. Uh, and then breaking with Obama, Biden also pledged, if elected, he'd keep his disagreements with Israel private. Right, that's what they that's what they always said. It's what Obama said when he ran for office, and the most we got out of Obama was at the end of his term, uh, abstaining on the vote to censor Israel over expanded settlement activity, settlement that's, growth. That's what that's the gist of Josh Rubner's book, right? The, the disappointment in the in the Obama presidency with regard to Israel. Let me yeah. give you statistics and then finish your thought about Biden. About well, I wasn't, I wasn't disappointed at all with Obama. I expected this. Uh, I always did. And I expect the same from Biden, but there won't be the same rapport that he has with Trump. And I still think Israel, through some mechanism, will try to intervene against Biden uh, if they think the race is close enough and Trump could possibly win. It just doesn't look like it's going to be close enough. We saw through Roger Stone's uh, testimony yeah. that there was an attempt uh, to get Israel to intervene in favor of Trump. So uh, Netanyahu clearly wants Trump to win. They've had they've had had it great. Biden has to answer to the same constituency that elected Jamal Bowman. It's more progressive than it was when Obama was elected, uh, and younger the Democratic Party base, and. What's happening in the streets with the George Floyd protest is only accelerating that process. But the Democratic Party remains deeply undemocratic in ignoring that base. And it can take it for granted as long as it's running against Donald Trump and everyone's so afraid that the biggest monster, the person who Biden called the first racist president in American history is the opponent. And that's the problem here. If no one's holding Biden accountable, and he can take everyone for granted, assume that all the Bernie voters will vote for him and that people who care about Palestine will vote for him just to get Trump out. Um, there, it's a very dis dismaying dynamic where you have this sort of uh, failed two-party system. And I, I don't know what, what we can do to apply pressure on an executive like Biden, but I would just say if he gets elected, uh, there's still going to be a constituency to answer to, if not in the White House, then in the streets. I wanted to ask you about this sea change that's happening in the Democratic Party and really uh, in, in the country. Uh, I was reading in Middle East Monitor, uh, for example, 
uh, about this Washington Post poll, 67% of respondents said that it's either, quote, acceptable or even, quote, the duty of elected representatives to question the Israel-US relationship. And among Democrats, so that's 67% generally, among Democrats, that number was 81%. Yeah, 81%. I mean, so there is a sea change that's happening, isn't there? Well, Bernie Sanders changed between uh, 2015 and 2016. He read the tea leaves and started have, listening to his constituents, and he had been kind of a, a lockstep supporter of Israel, and he became a much more vocal critic, which I think he had wanted to do. He was riding herd, as George W. Bush would have said, on his constituents. We saw even Pete Buttigieg, who is a complete stooge of the national security state, initially say that he would withhold military assistance to Israel if it went ahead with annexation. Then he pulled back when he started getting donations from big pro-Israel billionaires like Seth Clariman. So the real issue here, I think, is campaign finance. And when candidates are supported by small donations like Bernie Sanders got 20, that's my average donation was $27. I have thousands of individual contributors with $27. You know, when they can get, that's what Jamal Bowman's support base was as well. Uh, when they get individual contributions from actual people instead of these bundlers who basically just hand over their credit card at an APAC party, they are going to challenge the pro-Israel consensus every single time. And that's, that's great. Uh, it, it, wherever you live, if you can get enough individual contributors to, make, to get a viable candidate on the ballot, you can start to have a voice. The problem is once they get in Congress, you have Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to deal with. And I mean, Nancy Pelosi, you want to just talk about the, the phoniest, worst leader of the Democrats at a time when the Department of Homeland Security is sending federal, basically federal troops, federal forces on behalf of Trump against peaceful protesters. And she herself is calling them an occupying army. She's trying to author, to ram through funding for the Department of Homeland Security over the objections of progressive legislators. So Congress is a whole nother issue. I really think where you, we can have the most impact is at the, the very local level, city councils, school boards, places like that. We, uh, uh, we're getting close to the end here, Max, but uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you've been one of these, I mean, as you look back over your career thus far, and one of those, I would call voices crying out in the wilderness, you know, uh, um, We've interviewed here, we've interviewed here Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris from the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, she with her co-chair, William Barber, talk about the pandemic as having exposed the fissures in our country. They've also, so, and, and they've talked about reviving, talking about uh, Martin Luther King's evils, you know, uh, crony capitalism, militarism, racism. They're talking about uh, um, uh, uh, environmental stewardship and sustainability. But they're also, they've also had some strong words to say in support of Palestine. Are you, uh, so t tell us about your take on the Poor People's Campaign, but especially I'm interested in their call for a moral revival. And I guess you may or may not believe yourself to be part of that, but I see one of, the, one of the contributions you've made in your career, even though you've been talking about real politique, you know, domestically and on foreign policy, this idea of a moral revival is, is threaded throughout your writing. So anyway, that's a long question, but say a word about the Poor People's Campaign, about their take on Palestine, and on this idea of call for a moral revival in our country. Well, I... I... I'd have to put some thought into that. I, I don't follow the Poor People's Campaign that closely, but I think, you know, William Barber's managed to break through uh, and 
get out of the marginal circles that most left wing voices are confined to in the US. And he has spoken out for Palestine at the Democratic National Convention. Um, that partly requires a negotiation with the Democratic Party, but he's creating a lot of political space. Um, as for a moral revival of this country, I think we're in a, we're kind of in a civil war. This country is completely atomized in ways that I never thought it was going to be. We're in the middle of a em empire in deep decline. And I think we need to have a realistic perspective on where this country is going. Um, it's important not to have illusions, but we need people out there to inspire us as well to act. What I try to do at the gray zone is just to illustrate truth through journalism, classic journalism, investigative journalism, and to mentor younger journalists who are trying to break in who can't get work anywhere else because media is basically off limits to people who think like us. And we've been really successful in filling a void, uh, a void that's even been created in progressive media where there is a fear of challenging the national security state and a fear of taking on hostile Cold War narratives, just like we felt 10 or 20 years ago, this fear of touching the issue of Palestine. We're always going to touch the third rail. We're always going to cross the red lines that corporate media and the national security state and the consensus establish. And we're going to do it with facts, with real classic hardcore journalism. And, uh, you know, I'll leave it to the preachers uh, to, to, to speak about morality. I just want to talk about truth in a time where uh, it's often forbidden and censored. That might be in, in a day like today, as George Orwell and others have pointed out, that speaking the truth might be the highest moral uh, position you can take. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm gonna, and, and the most and the most dangerous one. <laughs> so, Max, uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, do you have any parting words for us? Well, uh, first of all, I, I I hope you uh, build up your Twitter account because that's where I can really promote these things. Um, so that's my one piece of advice is get more active on Twitter. Um, but, uh, no, this was, it, it was great to engage with everyone, but it's not the same as in person. Um, I came up to Fort Wayne, my first time straight from Venezuela, where I'd been reporting on the beginning of the U S coup and the U S backed coup. And I'd gone from a really, uh, semi-tropical environment uh, in a really warm city to the frozen tundra of Fort Wayne. And I wasn't sure what I was getting myself into, but I found a really warm community there. Uh, it was really incredible to see so many people come out in a small city in a red state. Um, and it's amazing what you've all built there. Um, so you know, on Passover, we always say next year in Jerusalem. So I'll just say uh, next year in Fort Wayne, hopefully we can do this in person. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, uh, just keep using whatever mechanisms are at your disposal to keep your, to make sure your voices are heard because people are really listening to us right now um, during this pandemic at a time when the mask is lifting on a very cruel empire that has never answered the needs of its citizens. Let's fight to make sure that all this human potential here in this country doesn't go to waste. Max, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you. Greet Anya for us. Uh, travel safely later on today. And thank you friends for joining us. We'll hopefully see you next Thursday with another conversation. Uh, thank you all for joining us today.